Now I want to uh, concentrate on the fair competition case. Uh, yes, one comment about this computation with the second moment. Remember, this computation is only in the fair competition case. And by the way, there was uh, some mistake in the constant. One thing was the, and the numerator should be on the denominator. It doesn't matter. The final answer was correct. Um, good. So we were over here. I told you what uh, is known for the classical Keller Siegel. Now let me tell you how to deal with this more general case. Let's start with um, uh, K between minus dimension and zero. In this range, obviously a good candidate to use here uh, in order to control these terms is the uh, famous hardy leadable sobolev inequality. Because for any potential modulus of x to the k, when k is by between minus dimension and zero, I have this uh, uh, famous inequality for which we know even the optimizers. So in fact, this is precisely what it tells you what is the critical parameter in this case. So let me uh, first tell you what is the hardy level sobolev inequality. So if uh, k is between di minus dimension and zero, the M related to, uh, uh, to K by the relation of fair competition, M is between one and two. And then what you can write is that the double convolution of Fx, Fy with modulus of X to the K is bounded by the typical uh, HLS. What it tells you is that what is there, okay, that we will not write here on the board, is, is bounded by a constant times the norm of F uh, the norm P of F square, where P is what is uh, 2D over 2D plus K. Okay? This is what you used hardly level Sobolev directly. Okay? The question is that here in the, in the functional, what is involved is the LM norm of rho and not the LP norm. Okay? And uh, then you can ask yourself what is the relation between P and M. So in fact, remember that uh, we are in the fair competition case. So in the fair competition case, um, you can check that in fact this is less than one minus D over K. This is a direct uh, inspection, just a check that, that this is true. And this is M. So in fact, the P is between one and M, and this happens again because we are in that range. Okay, in a sense. Okay, so um, so the comment is that this exponent is less than M, allows me to in, uh, interpolate the LP norm between one and M, and this is what I do. Okay, so I just uh, interpolate uh, uh, the LM norm between the, sorry, the LP norm here between one and M. I compute the exponents and I write the, the exponents in that way. Don't uh, forget that K and M are related always, okay, here. Good, and now the fact is that for our densities, Remember that for me, rho is always of L1 norm equals one. So this goes away. And then I can relate this to the LM norm of rho. So in fact, I have a relation between the two terms exactly in the free energy, okay? And then this determines the exact constant chi for which I can relate these two. Because also for that, uh, let me uh, make the comment for the HLS inequality, I know the optimizers. But this is not exactly the HLS inequality when I do the interpolation. Nevertheless, I can find the optimizers of that inequality. Okay? It's a different inequality and it makes a big difference. Because if you remember, for the HLS inequality, the optimizers are always of the Talenti form, are one over one plus x squared to a power. The optimizers of this one, which looks a naive uh, generalization of the other one, 
they are compally supported functions. So it's a big difference. Okay? And that's the interesting thing about this variation of the HLS inequality by interpolation. If you look at the optimal constant here, let's uh, call C star the optimal constant of that inequality, then what you can write directly is that you uh, identify somehow the critical parameter because the critical parameter will be related to the uh, optimal constant here and uh, then uh, somehow uh, the HLS inequality is true if and only if the corresponding free energy with that value of the critical parameter related to C star is larger or equal than zero. So this is the total, if you want, it's a total parallel with the keller siegel uh, for the keller siegel the inequality involved was the logarithmic hardy level of level inequality. And this was determining the constant 8 pi as the critical. Here, the, para the, uh, the um, uh, uh, function inequality that you need is this variation of HLS. Once you realize about that, then uh, it's not too difficult to uh, prove the... Um, uh, the existence of the optimizers of the inequality, or if you want equivalently the system of global minimizers for that particular value, value of the critical, uh, of the parameter chi, for the pre uh, critical chi. And, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, let me um, then, um, so, so essentially what you can prove, let's uh, make a summary here. Somewhere, I'm gonna erase where, probably here. Computation is not needed. So you have this variant of the uh, HLS gives you the sharp constant of that variant determines exactly the critical chi for which you have f of rho larger or equal than zero, and the equality cases here are equivalent to the optimizers of the inequality, or cases of equality of the variant HLS. Okay? Once you realize about that, then you have to determine the critical value. Here you have these infinitely many stationary states. And I told you that they are compally supported. I will give you an idea why is this the case. But this is the main difference with respect to the keller siegel case. They are compally supported, and they are like uh, a Helder function. So they are kind of C0 alpha at the boundary. So they look very much like Barenblatt-like solutions of the porous median equation. Yes, yes, it's the same business. Uh, uh, the, the same reason as for the, uh, H, uh, the HLS inequality. I mean, you can, uh, uh, all the dilations. Remember that the... Um, the f of rho is homogeneous. So once you have uh, f of rho equals zero, rho lambda will have also zero energy. They will be, all of them, minimizers. So in fact, it's a one-parameter family given by the dilations of, of that. The same business as the keller siegel sadly. Uh, okay, and then what you can show also is that if chi is less than chi c, the same uh, control here, now, just because chi is less than chi c, you can see that you can control separately the two terms in the free energy. And in fact, you have then LM norms bounded uh, for the minimizing sequences. And, and you can check, in fact, that uh, uh, the, the, um, the effect of that is that uh, you don't have the stationary states, in, uh, but you have them in scale variables. So let me just explain you that for chi less than chi c. For chi less than chi c, what you can do is something very similar to what you do also for classical Keller-Siegel. You rescale variables in order to make appear a confinement potential, 
And then for this one, you prove that there are minimizers. These, in original variables, what it gives you are self-similar solutions. So the minimizer of this gives you the profile of the self-similar solution in original variables. So here what you can prove is, in fact, global existence of solutions. You expect, I mean, you can prove. I said you can prove, but uh, we prove it only in a particular case. So in the whole generality, I'm telling you here, this hasn't been done. I hope that uh, at some point somebody will do, because uh, all the ingredients are there. So global existence of solutions. And we have this, for sure, what we have is these self-similar solutions. Of course, you expect these self-similar solutions to be the global uh, time asymptotics of the solutions that it happens uh, also in the classical Keller-Siegel. This is in particular one result that uh, Mishler and Egania did uh, recently. I mean, in the sense that they uh, did the, the best result known in that direction. Okay? Um, so you expect such a result also in, in that range here. And um, what uh, else I wanted to mention here? Uh, yes. So um, yes, for chi larger than chi c, I don't have anything there on the slides. But for that, I did this computation. OK? So for chi larger than chi c, what happens? In fact, this tells you already what is happening. You see, the critical case is where f of rho is larger or equal than 0. And the minimizers are for f of rho is actually 0. For chi less than chi c, the same inequality proves you that, in fact, f of rho is strictly positive for every rho. What happens when uh, you cross chi equals chi c and chi is larger than chi c is that you can prove that there are densities rho such that f of rho is initially negative. Once f of rho is initially negative, look at this computation. It's telling you the derivative of the second. Um, so if you have initially something, this is rho at time t, OK? But this is a free, uh, the free energy is a Lyapunov functional. This is less or equal than d times m minus 1, the free energy at time 0. So if this is negative, all of this is negative, and it's bounded by a negative constant, this tells you that the second moment should decay linearly. So it touches 0 in finite time. And there is a contradiction, as in the case of the classical keller seagull The second moment cannot be 0 unless you have a concentration before. So the whole uh, HLS inequality gives you uh, the full dichotomy again. This tells you that there it will be the resist blow up in finite time. And here, of course, what I'm telling you by this, I'm not telling you really that there is blow up. I'm just telling you that there are no global solutions with the right regularity such that I can uh, compute the second moment. Proving that there is blow up in finite time will be another business. Okay, and we don't have a proof yet of this similar to the one of the keller seagull But you expect, again, the same dichotomy. Okay. So at least with these computations I showed you, what you have is this dichotomy at the level of stationary solutions and what you expect of the free energy to happen in each of the cases. Good. So now, this I told you what happens when k is negative. Let me tell you a little bit what we know when k is positive. So what happens when k is positive? Okay, let's uh, first look at the sign here in this functional. If k, in the case k negative, this is negative term. m is between 1 and 2 in that case. This is positive term. When k is positive, we have the, uh, the things change this becomes positive, this becomes negative, OK? And if you want to find a uh, functional, um, I mean, uh, inequality, again, similar to HLS, it should tell you that you can control now this term by that term. So it's a kind of uh, reversed inequality of hardy levels of all left type. So in fact, that, is, uh, that range is much less under, understood. And what I can tell you is one thing that is interesting, is that 
there is no, for sure what we can prove is that there is no critical parameter chi. So why this? Uh, because what we can prove is that uh, um, just looking at the uh, um, uh, euler lagrange conditions that I will do uh, next on the board, you can um, show by fixed point arguments that you have always a stationary state for every value of the parameter chi. So at least there is no this critical value chi at the level of assistance of a stationary state. Okay? In this particular, for k positive, re, uh, let me remind you that m is between 0 and 1. So since there are some experts in fast diffusion equation here, in that range, the, you expect the solutions to be uh, supported on the whole line with some decay at infinity. Uh, in, in that case, uh, you had to look for the uh, solutions in the right space with the right decay at infinity. And this uh, is mm, given by the k, by the k moment, in fact. So, but uh, you can prove by direct fixed point arguments that you have a solution of the euler lagrange equation. So at least you have a stationary state for every value of the chi. So let me just uh, mention you in short, at least in 1D, this is uh, how it looks like. Uh, in the sense that uh, I allow k varying between minus 1 and 1. k equals 0 is the case of the log, so like the Keller-Siegel in 1D, say, sort of. And then uh, you have the, uh, what is in red are values for which you, have, uh, you may have finite time blow up, red, the ones in you will have uh, self-similar solutions here. Here what you have are stationary states. In, uh, but, but, uh, I forgot to say, you have stationary states in, uh, probably I said it wrong, um, in uh, scale variables, okay? So it's self similar solutions in the original variables. So here you have self similar solutions, stationary state in a scale variables. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, nevertheless, we are still trying to understand uh, the K positive. Um, uh, case uh, in other uh, ranges, which might be related to some reverse HLS inequalities that are in the in the market. But this is something that we are just uh, working at the moment. Okay, so this is everything I can say right now about the fair competition case. Let me repeat that for the evolution problem, we have very little results. It's mainly about stationary states. But let me do a computation for you on the board now, which is about the uh, euler lagrange conditions. Well, I don't know if, uh, yes, okay, probably I should. Yeah, because it's important also for the next one. Um, there is here now. So what are the euler lagrange conditions of this function? Uh, think about it. We have to do variations of the uh, functional for, with densities in L1, Lm. So doing the variations doesn't look that uh, uh, trivial here. So, but let's do it. Um, okay. So what I want to do is uh, take that functional and compute f of uh, rho plus epsilon phi minus f of rho divided by epsilon and take the limit and as epsilon goes to zero of this. For sure, if I uh, want to find Euler-Lagrange conditions, I will assume in, uh, be assuming that rho is a local mean at least, then uh, this should be at least larger or equal than zero, okay? I'm gonna tell you uh, which variations I want to use. So let's take phi related to rho. Let me take first phi of this form, rho psi minus the integral of rho psi, where psi is a given C infinitely compactly supported function. So it's as good as you want. I'm gonna assume that, uh, yeah, um, nothing. I don't need uh, yeah. I don't need anything more. 
Um, so let's check one thing uh, here. I need the integral phi to be zero because I want to preserve the, the mass. The integral rho plus asylum phi should be one. So it's clear from the form. I chose it because the integral rho is one. Okay, so the integral phi is zero. And uh, also if you choose epsilon small enough, then you can check that rho plus epsilon phi is larger or equal than zero. Okay? So in fact, you just uh, need epsilon, for instance, in a brutal way, epsilon is smaller than twice the norm of psi in L infinity. Um, yes. Good. So then you will get this if you do, if you do that. And in fact, um, if you want, you can start by doing it with the psi larger or equal than zero. It doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, what you will get if you do this computation is easy to see that what you get, you do the formal computation of uh, at least the, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> the Taylor expansion of the power rho to the m at zero, and you do for the other term is very easy because it's quadratic. What you get is exactly the variation of f with respect to rho that I wrote before. It's uh, not here. Variation of f with respect to rho is somewhere here, but uh, is m over m minus 1, uh, rho to the m minus 1, plus uh, modulus of x to the k divided by k on both rho. OK, so what you get is this multiplied by uh, phi. And this should be larger or equal than 0. <clears throat> OK? In principle. Good. Now what I'm going to use is this particular form I chose of phi. And then you see that from here, I can write this in the following way. So I get variation of f with respect to rho. Then I get uh, uh, rho psi. And then I will have minus the integral of rho psi times uh, rho uh, uh, variation of f with respect to rho, no? Correct? Yeah, I can write it if, I, if you want like this. And this should be larger or equal than zero. Uh, is it correct what I'm saying? Uh, uh, wait, maybe I may, uh, yes? Yes, correct what I'm saying, yes. Good. So, what you get from here is in fact, uh, you can uh, now uh, compute if you want, uh, 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 this, uh, this is a constant, in fact, because uh, you can, uh, this, uh, this is uh, something that depends on rho. Let me call it D of rho. One, okay, whatever it is. It can be written in terms of the free energy, but I don't really uh, need it now. And then from here, what you get is that uh, the variation of rho minus uh, d of rho uh, times rho psi, so that you're equal to zero. You put it all together, okay? And in fact, um, uh, the, the sign of psi doesn't uh, play any role in this computation. So you can uh, choose either psi positive or negative. So at the end of the day, you can put that uh, you have also the equality here. OK, the, the, the sign of psi doesn't enter at all in the computation. So you can choose psi minus psi, and then you will have the equality here. So you see from this that on the support of rho, this should be equals to a constant. Okay, so from this computation, what you get is that the variation of f with respect to rho should be equal to a constant, which is determined by rho itself, but a constant on the support of rho. Okay? In fact, you could have guessed this, 
The question is that you determine the constant. Why you could have guessed this? Because uh, the PD, in fact, is here divergence of rho, gradient of the variation of f with respect to rho. So you see that the steady state, for sure, is when this is constant on the support of rho. Because either rho is zero or the gradient of, the, of this is zero. OK? But you get it from just uh, this simple computation. Let me not do uh, another variation. You can do another variation, but I'm going to just write the test function that you, I use and not do the computations. But you can do another phi. Now you play differently with the test function. So you take a psi, but instead of doing that, you take psi minus rho integral of psi. OK? The difference being that now you need, uh, uh, before, since rho was multiplying, so this only appears when you are inside the support of rho. Outside, you don't have anything. This is 0. But here, now, you have to be careful. Outside the support of rho, the only thing remaining is psi. So psi has to have a sign. And here is important. So here, psi has to be larger or equal than 0 in order to impose that rho plus epsilon phi is larger or equal than 0. So here, it wasn't playing a role, but there it plays a role. So if you do the same kind of computation, what you can see from here is that you get the following relation. So you get the integral of psi, variation of f with respect to rho, minus this constant, the same constant, d of rho. This has to be larger or equal than 0 for every psi larger or equal than 0. So what's the information that you get out of these variations is that this has to be true on the support of rho. And what it has to be true is larger or equal all over, say, on R d. OK? So this reminds uh, a lot what happens with the uh, Barenblatt profile. And in fact, from here, you can write somehow what uh, the mini, the, the, all the critical points should look like. From this computation, OK, here I can write. Now let me substitute what is uh, the variation. So I have m, m minus 1, rho to the m minus 1, plus uh, modulus of x to the k divided by k, combo of rho. This has to be uh, equal to a constant inside the support of rho, a larger or equal than that constant outside. So for, minimum, for critical points of that energy, what you can write is that I can take rho outside from here. So you can write rho. I mean, uh, so I put this on the other side, d of rho minus modulus of x to the k, divide by k, combo of rho. I multiply by the constant, so let me put him m minus 1 over m, here m minus 1 over m. And then rho has to be what? Well, it has to be, in fact, the positive part of that to the 1 over m minus 1. So you can convince yourself that these two things tell you at the same time, these two things are important to tell you at the same time that what you have is exactly that rho satisfies this. So of course, it's an equation, an integral equation for rho. But what do you learn from here? Now you learn how it can happen that this is compactly supported. Because what you need to prove somehow that the, the uh, growth of this, uh, well, that this grows at infinity, or I mean, it has to be the right uh, uh, let me see, k is negative, m here, minus, minus, this is positive. So this has to go to uh, minus infinity, the whole thing, in such a way that this is compactly supported. And in fact, this is how you prove that it's compactly supported, okay, in that range. And um, also it tells you that in that case, uh, in you, another way of proving uh, stationary states would be to find, some stationary state, to find solutions of the um, uh, of this uh, internal equation. This is how we attack with the, in the scale variables the, uh, solu the uh, system of solutions of, uh, in the k-positive case. So just to mention that these are the Euler-Lagrange equations now. They look also 
quite a lot like uh, the obstacle problems, if uh, somebody talked about the obstacle problems last week. But I don't want to enter into that. Good. So, now that we learned a bit about why it could be that the solutions are company supported, uh, let me go now and discuss the other uh, range. The diffusion dominated case. So in the rest of the talk, now I want to concentrate in what I can say for this range. And the first part will be more general than that range. It's about the stationary states uh, for any m larger than one, in fact. OK. So let's go now to the diffusion dominated case. So we are in the case in which, by dilations, I have a minimizer in lambda. And I expect the diffusion to uh, dominate uh, in the system. But, in, but uh, in which sense does the diffusion win here? So as I told you with uh, Van San Calves and years ago, we uh, subtly studied this particular case. So in two dimensions, you take uh, k equals 0, m larger than 1. And we prove in that paper that uh, all solutions are globally, the cis globally, and they have uniform bounds in time. Uniform in time. But what happens with the long time asymptotics? That was the um, open problem there. And of course, we knew for a long time what uh, was the conjecture, but uh, we were not able to prove it. Already by simple numerics at that time, we realized that the expected asymptotics was somehow only given by a uh, stationary state. So what we uh, were expecting is as t goes to infinity, you converge towards uh, a stationary state uh, with the uh, right uh, center of mass, because this is a translational invariant. So let's assume the center of mass is zero initially, and with the right, uh, I mean, if we are normalizing the mass with the right mass. Good. So this is somehow what uh, you, it came out of the, uh, uh, of the simulations. Always you converse towards something which is, in fact, compactly supported. And uh, here, what I'm plotting is precisely this function. I'm plotting the variation of f with respect to rho. So you see that in the support, is constant. Outside the support is larger or equal than that constant. OK? So this is what we wanted to prove for a long time. OK, so let me tell you how we got into, into uh, proving this after uh, several years. Uh, the first thing is, what happens with global minimizers? So again, I'm going to do it in this particular uh, case of the, of the log uh, today in the, um, uh, on, on the slides, the log in two dimensions. But uh, very recently, with uh, my PhD student, Franca Hoffman, we just finished a paper that is on archive for a, for a month by now, in which we do the same stuff for the whole range. Diffusion dominated for every k negative. OK, so let me explain you how to get the global minimizers for this. So what you want to do is to uh, find the uh, minimizers in the set of densities. Here in this part of the talk, I'm not going to normalize the mass. Instead of uh, having the chi, since uh, the chi doesn't play any role in the diffusion-dominated case, there is no chi, in fact. So I'm not going to normalize the mass. I'm going to leave the mass equals m. So I look for the minimizers for every m with the zero center of mass. Well, and just to state uh, some of the results, I introduced this uh, particular subset, which is the subset of the L1 LM densities, which are radially decreasing. OK, I use the notation of uh, decreasing rearrangement with this sharp. Um, I will discuss something about the decreasing rearrangement later, so I can explain you a bit what it is. It's a way of uh, constructing a radially decreasing function out of a function rho. And if you have rho equals rho sharp, it means that they are radially decreasing. And uh, the thing, uh, well, the statement that we can prove is that we have 
a unique global radial minimizer of the free energy for every mass m, okay, in this case. So let me explain you how this goes. In fact, in this case, since I had the log, the role of the HLS before I explained you in the previous one, it will be played by the, the, uh, this uh, variation of the HLS that was introduced by uh, Carlin and Loss, the log HLS. So the first thing is that uh, you can check that uh, uh, minimizer should be radial just because of the, the job that they did, because they proved that uh, the interaction energy with the log decreases with uh, 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 rearrangement. And uh, also by using the inequality of the log HLS that they proved in that competing symmetries uh, paper, which is exactly that, that's the log HLS. I, uh, uh, you control the interaction energy of the log with the intra of roll of rho instead of the power with the LP norm. That's the kind of inequality you have. And the, ma the mass enters into the uh, constant here. And here this constant is explicitly known depending on the mass, and you know also the, the uh, optimal uh, functions for that inequality, even if now this uh, doesn't play a big role. The interesting thing is that this inequality implies, in this case, that you can prove that this, since m is larger than 1, you can prove that this free energy is bounded below, directly. Why essentially? Because uh, uh, since you know how to control this in terms of rho log rho, what you, you add and subtract here rho log rho, uh, with the log HLS you kill the log interaction, and then you just need to play with the behavior of rho to the m and rho log rho at infinity. Since m is larger than one, then that is bounded below. Essentially that's the game. So it's very easy to check that this, uh, with the log HLS, then you have a bound from below the energy. So you can talk about the infimum of the energy. Now, if you want to uh, pass to the limit in um, uh, minimizing sequences, we know our minimizing sequences are radial functions. We know that uh, the bound, the, the, this function is bounded from below. So the next step you can do can display some things here on the board about this. So, remember that I'm discussing about the case with the rho to the m, 1 over f minus 1, and that will interact with the log. Probably there was a constant here, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, and what you know now for a minimizing sequence is that this is bounded from below, and uh, the thing is that from there, you, you can convince yourself for the minimizing sequences that both terms, because you have the bound from below, both terms are separately bounded. That's uh, the, the information that you get because it's bounded from below. And uh, from there, you have a bound on the LM, which is good if you want to apply any compactness. But also the problem that you want to, uh, that you have is that you want to keep the mass of the possible limit of the minimizing sequence. So you need to avoid the loss of mass at infinity on the minimizing sequence. And this is a kind of a neat uh, here because uh, it's not clear which of the two gives you that? In fact, it should be this, but uh, it's not so clear from here why there should be a con confinement of the mass. But the control of this gives you such a control on the mass outside a ball of radius r of the minimizing sequences. You can show that this decays like 1 over the log. And here it's essential that the functions are radial. Here it's essential that the functions are radial. Let me give you an idea about this, because I think it's neat, the R1. Uh, first, here you can show that uh, for any R, you have a control of, uh, of these quantities, 
Because you control this, you control also that. Why? Because for modulus of x minus y less than r, that part, because the, you do a helder with the log and you have the LM norm, you can bound it with the LM norm of rho, essentially. The local part with the LM norm of rho, you can control it. So then you have a bound, let me just assume, if you, if you want, take this as an assumption, that there is a constant that gives you, that this is uh, uniformly bounded on R. If R is uh, larger than, say, than one. Okay. Now the thing is that um, let me take, now I fix an x with modulus of x larger than r, okay? And then I take any y such that x dot y is less or equal than zero. So essentially what I'm doing is the following. I take the ball of radius r, I take an x, say here, which is modulus of x larger than r, I'm taking this set of the y's. Okay? Then, what is easy to check is that x minus y is always larger or equal than modulus of x, and then, sorry, uh, yes, and then larger or equal than r. Okay? I mean, just to check that, put the square, span, then the scalar product has the right uh, direction, and then that's easy. So then, for any of this is included in that set, so I also have a bound on this quantity. So I have a bound on the integral in R2, integral on, uh, uh, let me see, uh, sorry, modulus of x larger than R, integral x dot y, less or equal than zero of that quantity. So this is bounded now, okay, for any x. Well, I mean, this is bounded. For any x modulus of x larger than r, I did that, and then this integral is bounded. And now, is here where I'm gonna use that row is radial, because you see, uh, Modulus of x minus y is larger than r. r I'm taking it larger than one. So then I can say that this is larger or equal than the integral of modulus of x larger than r log of modulus of x integral rho of x. And uh, here I can put the rho y, well, I mean, I can put it there, here the integral of x dot y less or equal than zero of rho y, dy, dx. Okay? And then here, what do I get? It's just the integral of rho in, a, uh, in half space. Since rho is radial, the integral of rho in the half space for any x I choose is one half, is m over two. It's half of it. So then this is m over two. So then you control the log moment, okay? So this is a neat way of controlling the, the mass outside, uh, outside above. And then to, uh, these together with the control of the LM norm, I said uh, modulo very easy computations gives you the right compactness to achieve the minimum, okay? Good. So you have a minimizer now your minimizer satisfy, I'm mean, sorry, you, you uh, have a, yes, you have a minimizer. A minimizer sequence has a limit. Uh, you can talk about the minimizer, I mean, a minimizer in principle. And um, we'll talk about uh, why it's unique later. So a global minimizer will be uh, radial and will be a solution of uh, this uh, uh, euler lagrange equation that I mentioned before. Here I'm read, uh, writing you uh, for you uh, what it is exactly the constant in terms of the free energy. Remember the free energy, I call it uh, G to make it different from the previous one because it's a particular case, okay? And as a consequence, as I told you before, your minimizer will satisfy 
uh, this, con this uh, uh, equation. Okay. So from there, working on that equation that I will not uh, um, uh, do the details, you can uh, obtain that uh, they are compactly supported, continuous function, in fact, held there up to the boundary, and smooth inside the support. You have to work a bit on that. It's not so easy. Uh, but uh, that's um, somehow uh, with uh, the main ingredient, uh, start from uh, this uh, relation. And um, then, with respect to uh, uniqueness, well, uniqueness, we didn't prove anything because it was already uh, proven that there was uniqueness of radial solutions, in fact. This was already known for quite a long time. So, in short, uh, what, uh, this, was, this was done by Yao Yao and Ing Won Kim uh, in the thesis of Yao uh, as a variation of uh, results of Lib and Yao for, for some related functions. And the idea is to use mass comparison and radial coordinates. So I'm not going to enter into that. So this gives you the uniqueness part of the theorem. So what we got is the, the uniqueness of the radial global minimizer, radially decreasing and nice and smooth. So we have the good candidates for the long time asymptotics, okay? But what's the problem uh, to uh, really get the result of the long time asymptotics? That uh, the problem is about uh, the stationary states. Why? Let me, uh, since I don't have that much time, uh, I don't think I will be able to get into the most recent results, but uh, let me mention to you what's the difference between the minimizers and the uh, stationary states. So now, let's go back, now that we have the good candidate to be the long time asymptotics, let's go back to the time dependent equation. So I write it in the short uh, way. Okay? So let's assume that we have all the a priori estimates that tells you that time divergent sequences of this have compactness. Okay? Let's assume that we have that. Then we can get any, uh, for any time divergent sequence, we could get subsequences that converge towards something, and that we can identify that as a stationary state of this equation. Okay, so that first part, in fact, all the ingredients were in the literature and we just put them together. So one can check that all possible uh, candidates for long time asymptotics, they should be stationary states. And what do I mean by stationary states? I mean that, uh, uh, in fact, that I have, um, yes, probably, uh, let me go here. Uh, Yes, here. So that's what I mean by a stationary state. Okay? So I'm going to assume a bit more on the uh, uh, row, just to uh, simplify my life a bit. So I'm going to assume L1 L infinity. I'm going to assume that uh, power M is in H1 log. I'm going to assume that um, uh, the, uh, well, in fact, you can check that in that case, gradient U comes off with the row is in L1 log. And then it satisfies this relation in the sense of distribution. This relation in the sense of distribution is somehow rewrite this equals to zero in a different way. Okay? Well, the interesting thing is that in that case, what's the difference? The difference is that for a stationary state, this guy, the variation of f with respect to rho, the only information that you get is that it should be constant. But the constant might be different in different connected components of rho. So nobody is telling you first that the stationary state is radial. Nobody is telling you that there is only one component in the, um, uh, in the, in the support. So the thing is that the only information that you get from the stationary state is that you have that the, the uh, variation of the free energy, which is written there, is a constant with i being in some uh, uh, index that could be uh, countable, but uh, uh, it could be uh, yeah, uh, in, an infinite uh, set of uh, connected components. 
And the constants may be different in the different connected components. So a priori, I don't know if I have a unique stationary state in the sense that the constant is the same everywhere like it happens for the global minimizer given by this formula or this formula here. So the question is, can there be other stationary states rather than the one that I find by global minimization? So it's a question about uniqueness of the stationary states uh, if we want to get the results finally. And uh, um, just to uh, finish, because I think it's almost my time is almost over in a few minutes, no? Like uh, five, ten? Ah, okay. So th then let me tell you the main, the, main, uh, the main difficulty that we found. The main difficulty is precisely to avoid uh, this. It's a question about when you can prove that uh, stationary states are radial or not, in a sense. That's the main cornerstone of the, of the, of the uh, proof. How can we go around uh, symmetry there? So in my previous work that I uh, was discussing before with uh, um, uh, Bruno Bolzon and Daniele Castorina, we were able to prove the radially symmetric, uh, the radial symmetry for the stationary states assuming that the stationary state was compactly uh, supported. Okay, if it's compactly supported, we were able to do it. And this was by a kind of a non-standard moving plane technique that uh, Daniele came with a very nice idea to overcome the standard difficulty for doing it with a non-local uh, term there. But the compactly supported was a uh, helping uh, for doing that. Nevertheless, even if we know for compactly supported that the only one is radial, Still, is not enough if we want to do the long-term asymptotics because we don't know, a priori, we don't know how to prove the solutions, even for compactly supported initial data, they are compactly supported for all times for this PD. This I don't know how to prove. Very good open problem. If we knew that, that would be done, at least for compactly supported initial data. So we needed uh, to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, improve on the assumptions that we do on the stationary state to prove that it's radial. Okay, so that's uh, the main result, in fact, of the new, the most recent res uh, work in this direction. So let me at least uh, state uh, the theorem. So, in fact, it's for more general than the one that I was discussing with the log and uh, m larger than one. So, in fact, uh, th this shouldn't be there if for m larger than one. For any m larger than one, if uh, I have a general uh, aggregation diffusion equation of that form, L let's try not to read all the assumptions, okay? I'm gonna just tell you in words what I assume, m larger than one and u being less singular than Newtonian at zero and behaving at infinity like Newtonian in, a, in any of the corresponding dimensions. So essentially these assumptions include the, the Newtonian in any dimension, okay? But the singularity can be less singular than Newtonian at zero. So for the whole family, what we, can, we have proven with uh, Yao Yao, sorry, uh, probably in order, Sabine Hidmaier, Bruno Bolsone, and Yao Yao, what we have proven is that all stationary states in this definition that I show you have to be radially symmetric. Okay, so that's the main result that we have done. And uh, let me just mention uh, in a few minutes, some of the ingredients. So, well, this I told you already what the difficulty was. Uh, the difficulty about uh, the stationary states. So let me uh, tell you what are the main ingredients. The main ingredient is in fact, again, the variational structure. So for me, it's the first time also that the variational structure enters uh, in this kind of uh, equations uh, mm, very crucially at the level of uh, properties of symmetries. So we use the, the Lyapunov functional that is behind the structure of the equation. And it's an argument by contradiction. Um, so I'm sorry it's going to be a bit technical the next slide, but I think it's uh, worth it to mention how this is done. Uh, the argument by contradiction is the following. You assume that um, the uh, 
uh, steady state is not radially symmetric uh, after any translation. So let's fix that it's not radially symmetric uh, about uh, some hyperplane, and let's put the hyperplane to be x1 equals 0 to simplify. Of course, you can always do this. So let's assume that it's not radially symmetric. Now, let me explain to you how we did uh, uh, the contradiction. I'm going to explain to you how we construct a family of uh, functions depending on one parameter. So they are going to be perturbations of the steady state, which I assume is not really symmetric. I call rho epsilon. And I'm going to prove, well, I'm going to tell you more or less that what we were able to prove is that if I compute the energy of this family of functions, the difference of the energy with respect to the energy of the stationary state is less than a constant, I mean, uh, minus a constant, so constant is positive, times epsilon. So it decreases linearly with respect to the parameter epsilon. And uh, the constant is uh, quantitative. Okay? We can compute a bound in such a way that this is at this. OK. So I'm going to tell you two things. First, I'm going to tell you how we did the construction of the rho epsilon. And second, why this gives you a contradiction. So uh, let me start by uh, telling you uh, why we, uh, how we construct it. So we constructed using a different uh, rearrangement technique that was uh, already available in the literature. This uh, was used by people in um, minimization, uh, precisely of the, uh, in particular, of the Newtonian uh, potential. And uh, in, uh, also was used by people like Cavol and uh, Almut Burcher in different problems in, um, in elliptic equations. And they, uh, they were using this kind of a con continuous Steiner symmetrization. Let me explain you a few words what it is. In one dimension, it's uh, nice and easy. And it's essentially in this picture. So it's a way of constructing out of a non radially symmetric function, let's say in one dimension, I start with this mu naught, my non radially symmetric function, to construct something depending on a parameter. Sorry about the t, it should be epsilon. Something that depends on a parameter which is more readily symmetric than what you started. So how do you do this? <coughs> so in one dimension is, is easy to do. In more dimensions is the same business, but thinking in terms of uh, needles. I will explain to you why I call about needles. So uh, you do a kind of layer cake representation of the function, and in each of the set of the uh, of the uh, of the horizontal. Uh, sorry, the vertical cuts here. You compute for every of them its center of mass. So the center of mass originally is the red bullet here. And what you are going to do is each of these needles, you are going to move it towards the center of the mass a little bit. So this needle here is a bit uh, to the right, so I'm going to move it to the left. So I put it on the, uh, on the, black, on the uh, blue square. The same for this one here. This one is center, so I leave it. This one is to the left, so I move it a bit to the right, and so on. OK? So it's like uh, cutting it into needles and make it down a bit more uh, readily symmetric, putting the center of masses towards the, uh, towards the uh, center of mass. Of course, if I move them, all of them to this, I get the standard well, a kind of a rearrangement. And uh, this gives you a way of. Uh, doing small perturbation, in fact, making it a bit more radial symmetric. So you can uh, generalize this kind of idea for more dimensions, and even uh, it's, it's not uh, too difficult. Again, always thinking of needles and uh, playing with uh, all the, uh, just in one direction, moving the corresponding uh, level sets. And if you do this kind of uh, uh, symmetrization, you keep the LM norm, like in the usual uh, decreasing rearrangement. And it was known, uh, this was proven already by uh, Brooke, uh, in the uh, end of the 80s. He proved that, in fact, the Newtonian potential, he did it only for the Newtonian potential, that then it decreases. The interaction potential with the Newtonian decreases by doing this. But he, did, he just proved it decreases. What we had done is 
to check exactly how much it decreases with epsilon, because for us it was important to know exactly quantitatively how it decreases. And we proved that, in fact, it decreases linearly with epsilon. So there is where we had to work uh, quite a lot to prove that, in fact, this decrease is linear. OK. So we found uh, this direction in which uh, we decrease the energy that goes linear. Now, why this is a contradiction? Well, the thing is that we can massage a little bit more the, uh, this decreasing rearrangement in such a way that also we have this property for the curve that we construct. So in order to have this property, what I want is that the support of the mu epsilon doesn't change. If I do exactly what I said in the previous slide, this will change. But what I'm going to do is near uh, the support, I don't touch, and I increasingly touch for a very small uh, uh, height, and then I do this continuous Steiner symmetrization, and the error that I make is not that small, and I can still control that it goes like minus C epsilon. And then on top, I can tell you that the mu epsilon uh, satisfies um, uh, that property. So it's not too far from the steady state, and then we have this control, exactly. Okay, so this is an additional work that we need to do to massage a bit this mu epsilon. So believe me that this we could do. And uh, now what's the contradiction? The contradiction comes from the fact that being a steady state, you somehow are um, a critical point of the functional. So then the error in epsilon should be quadratic. It cannot appear at the first order. So just because it's a stationary state, you can check that the e to the uh, e of uh, the energy of mu epsilon minus the energy of rho s should uh, be like uh, of order epsilon square, and uh, that's the contradiction now. On one hand, it has to be epsilon square for epsilon small, but the difference of the energy, in fact, is linear, and that's where we get the contradiction. So. It's the first time that I see the use of this uh, continuous Steiner symmetrization and using variational arguments related to these gradient flows in order to get symmetries. So with this, we were able to fix the problem of the radial symmetry of the minimizer, uh, I mean, the radial symmetry of the stationary states. And then if you put together this with the previous result of minimization, what in, in the particular case, uh, ah, yeah, this is uh, probably not what I wanted to say. Uh, as yes, for the Newtonian potentials, we know that uh, um, for radially, uh, radial minimizers, we knew that they were unique. But let, let's not uh, continue with the slides, just to say that if you put together the two results, in the particular case of this energy, we know first, because of the radiality of the stationary states, we know all the stationary states are radial. Second, we know the global minimizer of this uh, free energy is radial. And third, we knew that it was unique. And the uniqueness came from the particular case of being Newtonian. OK? So then we have a unique stationary state with the same mass and center of mass that is radially decreasing. In general, for any potential U, if you put together this result with um, uh, the minimization that you can do in more general potentials, what you get is that you uh, have, uh, you reduce uniqueness uh, of uh, stationary states to uniqueness of radial stationary states. And there is no uh, general answer about that yet, only in the Newtonian case. Okay, so with this, we get the right candidate to be the long time asymptotics, uh, now without a, uh, any doubt, for the uh, right uh, uh, definition of a stationary state. And then, just uh, to finish, let me tell you that, yes, then you can get the long time asymptotic result, and it's what you expect and all of you have in mind. The unique uh, global minimizer of the free energy determines the uh, global behavior as t goes to infinity for solutions in the, uh, with initial data, at least in that space. And uh, of course, uh, with this kind of compactness arguments without any decay rate. But at least we get the global asymptotics. OK, and with this, I just want to conclude quickly the two talks. Sorry about the few minutes more. But uh, so I hope to have convinced you that uh, the different regimes make sense. 
for homogeneous pressure and kernels. In the fair competition regime, we know that uh, we get a very similar picture as for the classical Keller-Siegel case at the level of stationary states and cell similar solutions. There should be much more work to understand if it's at the same business at the, same, at the level of the evolution. This hasn't been done yet. For the diffusion dominated regimes, we uh, understand now by the symmetries based on, uh, on the free energy, and we get the good candidates in some particular cases for the low and asymptotics. But, um, and then we can get the, um, the um, long time asymptotics in the 2D case. If you want to go to the 3D case, that would be very interesting. What's the big uh, uh, open problem there? Uh, we don't know how to, um, uh, for larger dimensions, uh, we don't know how to get the confinement. The confinement is quite challenging, the confinement of the mass for the evolution problem. The confinement of the mass, uh, we know how to do it only in the 2D case. And um, I'm not going to show you why uh, it, it's so, but uh, there you need the confinement of solutions to the evolution problem. So you cannot assume any longer that they are radial. That's the big issue. And, uh, and uh, for dimension larger or equal than three, we don't know if there is confinement of the mass or not, which means that as T goes to infinity, we don't know if we lose mass at infinity or not. So with that, I stop, and if there are any questions, we can discuss.